Howdy. Let's step back 100 years ago, into the roaring 20s. Most guys wore suit jackets, and ladies, sometimes called flappers, often donned knee-length sleeveless dresses and stockings. People also had a much lower life expectancy, around 50 in the USA, and there were some downright shocking things that people did. Perfectly normal 100 years ago, but very illegal now. And I'd like to explore with you just how much the world has changed. These are the things that everyone did 100 years ago, but are now illegal. Let's start with number eight. Heroin was sold as an over-the-counter drug. A warning ahead, this is really weird and messed up, and certainly not meant to promote drugs. Although nowadays we know that heroin is a highly addictive, illegal and dangerous drug, back in the 1910s and 20s, it was actually seen as a harmless cough medicine you could get from the pharmacy. It was even advertised for children. Heroin was first introduced in 1898 alongside aspirin. The word heroin came from the German word meaning heroic and strong. Because, you know, when I'm convulsing, itching and vomiting sprawled on the floor in an undignified mess about to go into a coma, that's just how I feel. Heroic. You see, it was the Bayer Pharmaceutical Company in Germany that first introduced this quote-unquote cough medicine. And they were mighty pleased with their concoction. And they were quick to begin advertising their new cough medicine. Yeah, organizations like the FDA had only just been introduced in 1906, and they were definitely not as good at being watchdogs back then. In fact, in the 1900s, morphine was a common recreational drug. You know, the one they used to bring emergency relief to people in the hospital room. So Bayer's heroin was advertised as a quote-unquote non-addictive morphine substitute. I don't know what they were thinking. Nowadays, of course, we know that heroin was one of the most addictive drugs in the world. The children's heroin advertising campaign began in Spanish newspapers, such as this ad, urging the use of heroina to treat bronchitis in kids. Here, we see a mum spoon-feeding heroin to her sickly little girl. The ad reads, La tos desaparece, which means the cough disappears. Yeah, the cough disappears because your child potentially stops breathing. Oh jeez, sorry, this, this is messed up stuff. Unsurprisingly, reports began to surface as patients were, shocker, developing a tolerance for the highly addictive drug. And addicts in the US were clamoring for more of this cough medicine. Fortunately, the FDA finally got their crap together enough by 1914 to at least make heroin prescription only. And Congress finally put their foot down by 1924, banning heroin's sale, manufacture, or importation. The drug was such a wide-scale disaster that the Anti-Heroin Act was introduced. So as much as some people might complain about the FDA nowadays, before they existed, it was a wild west. There was no watchdog. Companies could basically sell anything to anyone, no matter how dangerous, just to hell with the consequences. As of 2024, the FDA considers heroin a class one substance, and it's completely illegal even in medicine or hospitals. In my country, Australia, the maximum penalty for supplying heroin is like 25 years in prison. So maybe try a deep breath and a stick of gum instead. Hey, number seven. Corporal punishment. In case you don't know, corporal punishment means causing physical pain to someone in response to an undesirable behavior. At some point, almost all children misbehave, and it's a tough challenge for every parent on how to discipline their kids. Back in the 1920s, the term spare the rod, spoil the child was much more common. My school is a model of discipline. Use the rod, beat the child. That's my motto. Terrific motto. And we'll get to the true meaning of that phrase later. Corporal punishment can include many things, from a smack to a child, to a wooden paddle to a student, or even a whipping or a flogging to a prisoner. Here in Australia, back when our ancestors were all convicts, they were flogged for misbehaving a lot. But over in American schools, a wooden paddle was used to hit children on the behind. This was known as a paddling. Looking out the window, that's a paddling. While I don't have experience with paddling, over here in Australia, our students received a caning, aka the strap. 
this was essentially a long piece of leather that would strike the hand of a child. I was listening to the story of an old Aussie teacher from the 80s who was in charge of giving his students the strap. One time, a child was sent to his office for answering back. They were to receive two strikes across the hand with the strap. He was preparing to strike the child, warning them it would hurt but he couldn't get himself to do it. So he thumped the strap loudly on the wooden desk. This was enough to get the child to scream and wet their pants. From then on, all the five to eight year olds ran from him whenever he was on yard duty. It left a mark on the child and him, and he decided to never use or pretend to use a strap again. Nowadays, in most states, physical punishments in the schoolyard are illegal and will almost certainly result in a teacher being fired or suspended. That being said, even today, the World Health Organization found that 60% of children aged 2 to 14 years still receive physical punishment by a caregiver. So bear with me here, let's try and acknowledge both sides, because this is an important issue. What do the naysayers think? In some older crowds, some of whom may have received paddlings and hittings in their childhood, they may still say, kids are too soft now, we were hard and stronger back then because we got hit as children. Well, probably not in those exact words, but you get what I mean. And you know, I think a lot of people really do believe this. So I did a lot of research on this, and I found as of 2024, we have over 100 years of empirical research showing the long-term effects of physical punishment on children. These studies were done by teachers, parents, social workers, psychologists, doctors, the World Health Organization, you name it. And the majority of these studies suggest, although physical punishment might work in the short term, it can also result in long-term defiance and aggression in children. For example, one study found that physically punished kids were more likely to fear their parents. They were also more likely to bully other children, have lower self-esteem, be aggressive, and perhaps most obviously, it can teach them that hitting is okay. That's no good. Anyway, that's enough boring you with empirical evidence. Time for a fun fact to finish off. In reality, the term spare the rod and spoil the child was not meant to refer to disciplining a child, but rather it's from a 360 year old poem called Hudibras, where in fact a man is requesting from his lover that she, uh, yeah. If you think kinks are a new occurrence in history, you don't know the true meaning of spare the rod and spoil the child. And number six. Radioactive, arsenic, and mercury beauty products. Yeah, again, the FDA was still getting their crap together. So some downright stupid beauty products got frequently used. We gotta first check out these arsenic complexion wafers because jeebus, what were they thinking with these? Priced at only one pound, oh boy. Luckily, the National Museum of America kept a copy of these arsenic wafers. Made from 1916 through to 1928, what did our ancestors use these for? Why, for their facial complexions, of course. Let's start by reading the box. Dr. McKenzie's improved harmless arsenic complexion wafers. They will produce the most lovely complexion that the imagination could desire. It's clear, fresh, free from blotch, blemish, coarseness, redness, freckles, or pimples. Well, you sold me, buddy. Lucky you added to the title that they're harmless. Otherwise, I'd assume you were trying to kill me. The wafers worked by making the skin fashionably pale, as this arsenic concoction destroyed red blood cells. Interestingly, the quote unquote attractive young look in the 20s was to look as pale as a ghost. You look like a ghost to look younger? How does that work? But as you might have guessed, customers weren't always satisfied or alive. Sadly, there were multiple deaths. For example, Hildegard of St. Louis died after taking several boxes of wafers. Innocently enough, they were just trying to clear up a skin complaint. In another case, the Indianapolis Sentinel reported, The young lady gradually lost her sight after taking arsenic skin wafers. Her engagement was on hold as they tried to get her sight restored. Then we have Gorad's Oriental Mercury Cream. Truly a miracle that anyone would touch this without gloves. This cream will beauty the skin and work like magic. Ooh, magic. Is there a touch of fairy dust? No, just lots of calomel, a mercury compound. Over time, the mercury poisoned our 20s ancestors, though they could wear the cream once or twice without ill effects. Over time, they might develop 
dark rings around the eyes, loose teeth, and black gums. Ugh, all in the name of beauty. Somehow, this cream was available for decades. But finally, in 1938, the FDA was allowed to regulate cosmetics. And as you can guess, they very quickly banned mercury skin cream. And finally, in 1898, Mary Curie and Pierre's discovery of radium came along, and her ancestors were promised a positively glowing complexion, possibly burning a hole through the floor. At the time, no one realized the extreme dangers of radiation. In fact, they thought a heavy dose of radiation was a good thing. So they found all sorts of commercial uses for radium. In fact, by the 1920s, there was a craze for radium products. Normally, this radium was injected or taken in pills. Oh, jeepers, why? Radium was used to treat hair loss, impotence, gout, and so many more things. When the scientific method existed, how could we do this? Did no one say maybe we should check if this stuff was dangerous? So what was the name of this world famous product? Radior. Nin's gonna read this 1918 Radior advertisement to you word for word because it's hard to fathom now. An ever-flowing fountain of youth and beauty has at last been found in the energy rays of radium. Radium rays vitalize and energize all living tissue. Um, honey, this is too stupid to read. Well, I'm sorry. Apparently the scientific method was blatantly ignored for what we stuck on our face. Anyway, I think you get the picture. The highly irradiated picture. Needless to say, if someone tries to sell someone arsenic, mercury, or radioactive products now, they're likely to go to jail for both fraud and attempted murder. And for number five, almost all marriages were forced or arranged. In the early 1900s, romance almost didn't exist. It was a very new concept. For all of previous recorded human history, humans tended to marry for practical or financial reasons, or they were coerced into marriage with physical violence or subtle psychological pressure from families. Back then, it was just a procedure and there was no romance involved. And marriage usually involved the legal transfer of dependency of the woman from her father to the groom. Bleh. But sadly, that was life 110 years ago. There wasn't so much dating as there was courtship, where a male suitor would be encouraged by their family to call upon a woman. He'd meet for a supervised visit to her place, meet the parents, and talk to the lady in the family parlor in what must have been the most unromantic, boring date in the history of humankind. An example of a more directly forced wedding is a shotgun wedding, where the bride and groom were forced to marry, sometimes under the threat of being shot shot. Oftentimes the lady was pregnant, and uh, some religions see having children out of wedlock as violating their religious laws. A child out of wedlock is where the B word came from. Fortunately, over time, with the improvements in women's rights in most developed countries, we saw some major improvements in overhauls of marriage laws, where both men and women were treated equally and no one owned anyone. People began to marry because they wanted to marry, because they liked each other. And if either wanted to, they were always free to divorce and go their separate ways. Honey, if we divorce someday, I hope we stay good friends. Yeah, me too, hun. I'd so miss you if we didn't. In regards to different marriage types, although there's meant to be a difference between arranged marriages and forced marriages, the line of difference can be difficult to draw, as arranged marriages often have severe family social pressure behind them. And in older generations, it was seen as mandatory to obey parents, whether they were decent or horrible people. Of course, nowadays, the United Nations sees forced marriages as human rights abuse, and most developed countries have made forced marriages a criminal offense. But I am happy to say by the 1920s, romance had just started to bloom and courtship had just started to be replaced by dating. Some people called this the Jazz Age courtship, Couples could go down to speakeasies to drink, perhaps listen to a jazz band, dance a bit, and maybe finish with some petting and necking in a speakeasy booth. In fact, there's some reports of necking parties scandalizing the nation. Perhaps the beginning of hickeys? Gasp, what if she has a job interview tomorrow? Well, I guess that's what turtlenecks are for. But when do two people ever really love each other, as we do? Number four. Child labor. 
Federal laws to ban child labour are a disturbingly modern thing. Congress failed to pass a bill to lower children's working hours in 1916. In the USA, child labour wasn't even regulated until the 1938 Fair Labour Act. Before that, you better bet your kids could go work in the coal mines. They can't just be sitting around getting an education or even worse, having fun. But by the time they get to 6 to 10 years old, they could be earning their keep, making the family more prosperous. They could be plowing the fields, helping with livestock, or working at factories. This extra set of hands encouraged many parents to drop their kids out of school to start them working full time. I may make fun, but back then, many families genuinely needed the income earned by their children to survive. Otherwise, there was no food on the table. That's part of why it used to be seen as economic to have seven kids instead of one or two. Also, a portion of your kids were likely to die. Remind me why these are called the good old days again? But back then, it was just the norm. In fact, the 1900 census suggests that almost 2 million US kids aged 10 to 15 were working full-time jobs. Some were even working night shifts lasting 12 hours. But as of 1999, Federal law prohibits full-time workers under the age of 16. So nowadays, it would be very illegal to tell your child, Hey Junior, we're dropping you out of school to go work in the coal mines. But the Silent and GI generation were taught to never question authority. Fortunately, with the partial rise in household income and the availability of schools, kids started to spend more time in schools and playing and less time in full-time jobs. And it's worth mentioning, although child labour is frowned upon by most of the world nowadays, 20% of children in Sub-Saharan Africa still work full-time jobs. Many of these jobs are hazardous to their health. India and Ecuador have similar problems. Our world's got a long way to go, but I think it's important to acknowledge the world's improvements too. And for lucky number three, eugenics. The creepy, racist, selective breeding. Quote, those who proved unfit should be sterilized. End quote. Damn, that doesn't make you uncomfortable, I don't know what will. The goal of this eugenic selective breeding was to breed humanity into a quote unquote better species. Through heavy discrimination, a warning ahead, this one can be pretty confronting. While eugenics happened in many countries like England and USA, here in Australia, we used to have the disturbing movement of quote unquote breeding out Aboriginal blood. Ugh. The Australian government had the long-standing White Australia policy, which stood for 57 years, not ending till 1958. Isn't that also what the evil Voldemort wanted to do? To only have a race of pure bloods? Why yes, honey. Yes, it was. And you know, the guy who wrote Mein Kampf also had his own eugenics policy. It's in the past, but I think we can either run from it or learn from it. But you can either run from it or learn from it. In countries like the USA, they had marriage prohibitions and forced sterilization of people deemed unfit for reproduction. This often included people of mental or physical disabilities. Oh, this is making me so uncomfortable. And criminals and members of some minority groups. Over 64,000 Americans were forcibly sterilized under this policy. This policy went on till about 1963. But back in the day, many people seemed okay with it. In 1937, a Fortune magazine poll found that two thirds of respondents supported sterilization of mental defic- oh, oh, I think you get the point. But unsurprisingly, eugenics fell more out of favor in the 1940s. Why? Well, World War II ended in 1945. And the Nazis frequently use eugenics and selective breeding to defend their mass murdering policies. So obviously, non-consensual eugenics stomps all over basic human rights. But personally, I think it's the non-consensual selective breeding that's the problem. Because I think it's interesting to point out, nowadays, some consensual selective breeding does happen. But you might not necessarily consider it. For example, in a systematic review on prenatal testing, they found that 85% of pregnancies with Down syndrome resulted in the choice of ending the pregnancy. In that case, it's hurting more human rights to not allow consensual selective breeding. 
And of course, if we look forward to now, controlling a person's breeding is mostly illegal. Because trying to control a person's body would of course be monstrous. But at the time, this eugenics policy was happening everywhere. To quote the 1920s judge Oliver Holmes, No way! I can't say that. Fine, fine, I understand, I'll say it. Society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Bad. Yes, very bad. Only you should be deciding if you continue your kind or not. Number two. Seatbelts were rare and hated. Nowadays, seatbelts are so second nature that even Lego Wonder Woman tells her team to buckle up. Now, seatbelts, safety first. But in 1920, seatbelts were non-existent. In fact, steam-powered automobiles were still a new technology. Vehicles were mostly playthings to the rich, apart from maybe the Model T Ford. It wasn't until the 1930s and 40s that seatbelts existed in any cars. And even then, seatbelts were a very rare and optional part of the car. In fact, many people thought they were annoying. I guess having intact heads was annoying to them too. It all started because back in the day, hospitals were seeing a huge amount of head injuries coming through the emergency room. So seatbelts were finally introduced into American cars in 1949. But many American customers made it very clear they did not want them. Many customers requested that dealers remove them, or they just cut them out themselves. In a Nash report, they said, Our seatbelts were met with insurmountable sales resistance. But all over the world, car companies were finding a lot of vehicle deaths because of head injuries, such as the Swedish National Electric Company. So another small Swedish company came along, a little company called Volvo, and they started making the first seatbelts in Swedish cars. And I was quite proud to find out the first mandatory seatbelt laws came about in 1970 in my country, Australia. Would you like a belt? Yeah, I'll take two. One for each wrist. This greatly lowered our death toll on the road. By the 1980s, America got mandatory seatbelts too, which faced great opposition again. Many consumers went to court to challenge these draconian seatbelt laws. Some continued to defy the laws by cutting seatbelts out of their cars. Those evil car companies. It's my American right to fly through my windshield. I know it's a small minority, but some of these Americans and safety, if they're not going to war over face masks, it's seatbelts. And this is why we always wear our seatbelts. Nobody likes a backseat driver. And for number one, smoking was advertised by doctors and it was everywhere. And I do mean everywhere. People smoked on planes, <laughs> trains, hospitals, hotels, shops, probably <laughs> maternity wards. Let those sick hospital patients breathe in some of that poisonous, toxic smoke. In fact, in 1920, over 50% of men smoked cigarettes. Oh, that would have drive my nostrils and lungs mad. And it didn't help that at the time, doctors loved to advertise smoking. Because back then, smoking was somehow seen as healthy. By the 1920s, smoking companies have started targeting their advertising to women. So they advertise their death sticks <laughs> as somehow glamorous and demonstrating independence. <laughs> How? And every second movie had stars lighting up a death stick. Somehow, the ultimate sign of women's emancipation was hacking up black phlegm. I concur, and sadly, the cigarette advertising worked on both men and women. Everywhere you went back in the day, people smoked like chimneys. In fact, there were entire rooms in houses, trains, ships, and just about anywhere that were dedicated to smoking. So it's no surprise when commercial flights started in 1914, smoking was perfectly normal on a flight. And at the time, no one questioned it. In fact, it wasn't even until 1964 that the US Surgeon General released a warning on cigarettes caused lung cancer and coronary heart disease. But by then, Fred Flintstone was already advertising Winston Death Sticks. Winston Death Sticks, the original sponsors of the Flintstones. Tragically, all four voice actors for Fred, Barney, Wilma, and Betty smoked, and all four died of lung complications related to smoking. But back then, they didn't know. Vanda was the voice of Wilma, and upon her death, Vanda's son made a statement. That cute little laugh Betty and Wilma did with their mouths closed. <laughs> 
my mum came up with that because when they laughed normally, being smokers, they coughed. Fortunately, nowadays, the dangers of secondhand smoking are well documented. In Australia, we have the Tobacco Advertising Prohibition Act, and in the USA, the FDA watches the tobacco companies like a hawk. Speaking of someone in the 90s who did a 12-hour flight next to a chain smoker, I was so relieved when secondhand smoking began to be cracked down upon for the sake of those around the smokers. I couldn't stand that stuff. Ugh. Speaking as an ex-smoker, I'm relieved they ban smoking on flights. No one wants to breathe in someone else's smoke. Yuck. When I look at these problems, it's funny to me how some people see 100 years ago as a quote unquote good old days. Back in the 1920s, nearly 10% of all kids died within their first year. As opposed to now, where the infant mortality rate is more like 0.5%. It's not perfect, but it's damn well better than before. Even your most basic food is going to be way cleaner and safer to eat now than back then. With that said, thanks for listening to my ramble, and hope I might see you next time. Why? Today we have a fun member question from Sweet Wolf Steve. They ask, do you have to deal with dangerous animals in Australia, like spiders? Yeah, I do a lot of running and hiking in the forest mountains, so I encounter a few. We have the highly venomous red-backed spider here in Australia, but most of them hang under rocks and in the bush, and I don't stick my hand under many rocks, as that would be very stupid indeed. A more unavoidable foe I meet is the eastern brown snake. While they are the second most venomous snake in the world, I stay out of their way and most of the time they just run from me pretty quick. I've heard they're aggressive and bad tempered, but they've never chased after me. I've also encountered the mulga snake and the red bellied black snake, and a lot of carpet snakes, but they're less venomous. They tend to not give two craps what I'm doing and just take up the whole path for themselves. They're kind of jerks like that. Thanks for the question.